All right. I'm Tina Palmieri. I'm a burn surgeon, so I am your ode to diversity. And I am also your ode to operational response. It's my job today to make this real for you, and not just real for one disaster, specific disaster event, but to show you how this really can, has bigger implications than just the campfire. So I want you to, I'm gonna take you out of the sphere you've just been in. I'm a surgeon, right? Which means my idea of resilience is what doesn't kill you make you stronger, okay? This is a surgeon frame point. And so surgeons are always programmed to tell about our conflicts. I don't have any financial disclosures. I do some research with the military. I run a data center and I'm an active burn surgeon, obviously, because we're here, I'm on duty. The real disclosure is that burn disasters have been my passion. They've been my passion for many years. 911 was a huge wake up call for our particular community because 20% of the injuries were burn injuries. And with a, one slight turn of the plane, we would have had thousands of burn injuries. So it, this, this has been in the burn sphere for quite a while. I've worked with the American College of Surgeons. I've helped define disaster triage diagrams and so helped write some disaster courses for burns. And you're gonna hear a little bit about that. And on the ground, boots down. I've had to do burn triage in disasters. My biggest and most difficult was trying to triage 150 children two years of age who were all burned in Mexico. From California, I'm triaging 150 children with burns. Okay, and think of the, it's bad enough in the US, think about international conflicts. So I've had that wonderful experience, but it prepared me well for the ensuing uh, wildfires that we had here with the adults and, and some children, the Tubbs fire and the campfire. So I was the triage officer for that as well. So I've had a bit of experience, some boots on ground, and I'm gonna hopefully share that with you today. So we're gonna talk about the burn disasters and why you should care and why you should be a little bit frightened right now. And then we're gonna talk about some gaps. So are there more burn disasters or is it just because we live in California and everything, you know, the wildfires and the whole nine yards? Well, let's look at some data. This is the data from 1990 to 2000. The size of the balloon is the relative frequency of burn disasters. Look at the change between 2001 and 2015. And this, uh, the, si the one in Canada she is about double since uh, the last one, and the one in Australia has tripled in size since this was made. The incidence of burn disasters is increasing, and it's increasing markedly over time. So why would that be? Is, you know, people just playing with matches? There's a lot of reasons. There's industrial incidents have been very common, especially South America has been a, a plethora of disasters in that regard. However, we have some wildfire partners here, and we have wildfire partners in Australia. We have wildfire partners in South America. Africa doesn't even report theirs. They have them so frequently. So if you've ever traveled in Africa, they just accept that there's wildfires and that people are going to be part of that equation. But we very rarely hear numbers. And also, I was just in Edmonton, Canada last weekend and they are having quite the wildfire issue and their air quality, I would guess, was almost as bad as Sacramento on about November 20th. That's what it felt like. Are we ready for this? They're coming, they're coming more frequently. We are in some ways and we're not. Okay, well, let's see what we've done. What have we done? We've got burn center referral criteria. And every, pra every practitioner in every ER knows what these are and they're fantastic. In the, in the disasters, they are absolutely fantastic at triaging in those realms. There's advanced burn life support courses so that people know the very basics of how to do, take care of someone who's burned in the initial phases. This is a huge step forward, and our emergency providers have been excellent for that. There's austere guidelines already written so that when we have a shortage of burn supplies, there's a roadmap for people on what they can do and what they should use. Now, how many people have read these outside the burn community? Mm, well, that's maybe a gap. And we have regional disaster teams. Within the burn community, we have actually organized and we have telephone triage. We have entire triage trees for burn disasters. Now, this illustrates a big gap, however, too. 
does this division of labor match any division of labor in the federal system? No, because we're burn surgeons and, you know, we kind of, everyone, that it's one of the fundamental loopholes that we've got. It's not just because we're burn surgeons. It, it is that there's multiple levels. There's state, there's federal, and there's in between. And trying to line up all those organizations to be the same on any of these issues is a real challenge. And there's a disaster triage table that tells people what to do. This is actually based on national burn survival data. So we have a, an example of a triage document that, that's based in data, not on a provider making a judgment call. It helps to make things more objective so that hopefully we have a little bit less PTSD in our providers, knowing that there's something objective. And we've made progress. We've got the communication networks. We've got equipment. We've got some infrastructure and overall decreased deaths. But there are some problems. Now, if you sustain a burn injury and you're going to an emergency room and you expect that, you know, the surgeon that, gets, that is taking care of you, he's a trained surgeon. He must know how to take care of burns. Well, not exactly. It's not a required rotation for surgeons. Uh, it's not necessarily required. Emergency room doctors learn from other emergency room doctors on this, not necessarily burn unit. So the person you get treating your burn may or may not have had much experience in burn care. As on a national level, there is no national requirement. And because there's been a decrease in burn incidents, which means our prevention efforts are working, which is overall a good thing, there's less exposure. And when people do something less frequently, they're less good at it. There's been a huge loss of wound care knowledge. Um, there are new wound care technologies that people just put on and they leave them on for days and a week. And guess what? People forgot how to take care of the, with the other wounds. And burns you can't treat with those particular issues. There's a decreased number of burn centers, and we'll come to that in a minute. And the great job we do with transport, our, our EMS providers do a fantastic job, which is great. But what it means is that local centers, because they don't need to, to just have those supplies for 10 and 12 or 14 hours to transport somebody, they don't keep them around. None of our hospitals can afford to keep extra dressings, extra supplies. There's a, a par, a, a, an imperative for hospitals to be lean. And the downside of that is if there's a disaster, you don't have that backup. Um, and the result is that the average estimate of a burn size by a non-burn center provider is about 20%. And it's nobody's fault. Everybody does their best, but that's what it is. So a 50% burn could be anywhere from 30 to, to, to 70. Okay, think about how you're going to project your supply requirements with that kind of an error. It's very difficult. There's also burn center challenges. There are a limited number of burn centers. There's only 123 in the nation. There are less than 1,800 beds. If we got a, had, had 1,000 burn patients from 911, it would have completely overwhelmed the system. Completely. There was no, no one had the capability to take care of that. Regionalization does mean longer transport times, and burns they take a lot of resources. The average burn patient takes at least 40 medications a day. We did an analysis of how many medications our patients run. 40. Think of the logistics of trying to get 40 meds. You've got the poor person with heart failure at post a disaster who can't even get three. 40 in a disaster would be hard. Here's a distribution of burn centers in the United States, and now you kind of understand why those regions came to be. Note that if you live in Idaho, you have a bit of a problem. There's not even a burn center in your state. So the red dots are those that have been verified that meet criteria for quality. The others are burn centers that are pretty much they're self-declared that they are a burn center may or may not have met quality standards, yes. So we do have verification uh, criteria for burns as well, but it's not linked to funding. So there is not as much of an imperative to do that. But you can see in California, eh, we're not doing too bad compared to you know, Idaho, Montana, you, know, you got some problems. We also have a plan. So in the West, let's drill it down. There's 24 total centers, and you can see by state how many there are. We have a total of 390 beds for the entire Western region, if they're all empty. 
that on average because we actually run disaster tests frequently within our own consortium there's one hundred twenty seven beds available with a surge capacity to two hundred nineteen and we've done twenty two bed counts since two thousand and fourteen we so we try and take care of that now california we got some issues we have the biggest a big catchment area there's hospital overcrowding let's face it our e r s are full they're full all the time and so even on a good day we don't have lots of empty beds here we're talking the campfire 88 deaths notice that i have two extras because two people died after the fire in the hospital this was an older person's fire as has already been mentioned the campfire you've this is again a depiction you've seen it but think about both humans and animals were burned i've been working with my vet colleagues on this and the fire response was huge Lots and lots of people. I would like to say that we have lots of organizations dedicated to this, and my hat is off to them, and my hat is off to every institution that participated, and everybody did as, you know, you do the best job you can to get things going. And perspectives are important, too. There are no major roads, and wildfires suffer from a lack of transportation. And another disparity that I think we probably will need to address is the disparity in cell, phone, cell towers and communication capability. This was a region of California that had very limited cell tower capability. Communications in this region were very difficult. That is something that we probably need to think about um, because it was very difficult to get information back and forth. There simply wasn't enough bandwidth for it. There's one run, run in and out, and they were 90 miles to the nearest burn center. So you can see now why most of the uh, triage happened at UC Davis and Shriners, which fortunately were one of the, the biggest, the top five burn centers in the US is right there. But you notice we're it until Oregon. We're it going all the way out to Vegas. The next closest is the Botham Burn Center, which does not have a helipad. Um, so they cannot take anybody by helicopter. So they can only take patients by ground. Uh, which really makes us the main triage center because when your hospital like Feather River Hospital caught fire, everybody had to get out. This wasn't the time you were going to give us 10,000 calls about patients. And we were here before the Tubbs fire and the campfire response. I'm reminding people this was one of three fires that were occurring simultaneously. Um, I kind of have the poor man's attribute. This was the older person's fire. The people in this fire were older. They tended to be less uh, social than other fires. Um, and they had comorbid conditions, which in many fire cases was not the, the thing. Uh, the a Feather Hospital actually burned partway through this. So all of a sudden partway through this communication went down as they had to get out to save lives. And it's totally understandable that that's what to happen. So we started receiving patients without warning, and we activated the burn network. And there were, this should scare you, four beds immediately available in the entirety of Northern California for a burn patient. Everyone else was going to have to wing it. So if you were going to go to a trauma center, these were not dedicated burn beds. Four in the entire state. There were 53 in California. And there were 97 in the entire consortium. This is a problem in a situation where wildfires are likely to happen again. Now, if you included surge with the beds we could open, you could get that up to 214. These are sobering statistics. You have to look at this and be careful. The Woolsey and Hill fires, I would like to commend them for the incredible evacuation of the season. That's 295,000 people evacuated. That's amazing, okay? That could not be done in Paradise. Paradise had one road in, one road out, and people were too sparsely spread. So this is what we ended up with UC Davis. And you can say, oh, it's only 10 people, who cares? I on UC, they all got psychological interventions because they met every criteria you had. Um, and they were in the hospital for a while. And the average hospital bill, I can tell you, was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm sure we might've hit a million dollar person. Out, outpatient visits, we started getting those one day after the fire. And then I actually found out there was one person who drove all the way to um, San Diego. They wanted to get rid of into good air quality, so they just kept driving until they liked the air. So they went all the way to San Diego. The veterinary team also came in because the first thing every patient said was, I had to leave my animal. How is my animal? I will not separate from my animal. 
And this is just a, a short synopsis of the veterinary response. And this response is ongoing. I'm still helping them with some of these animals. And there's a llama still on, on the vet campus that hasn't quite healed yet from this. But even the koi fish got involved. These are the human injuries. And if the fire wasn't bad enough, you heard about the rotavirus. Okay, if, if fire isn't bad enough to get diarrhea and have a fire and lose everything, that's like, you know, that's the second hit, third hit. Lots of things got destroyed, and we learned disaster can happen at any time. It, there's no warning. Knowledgeable support staff is going to be the rate limiting factor because you can have all the supplies you want, but if you have someone who does not know how to put a dressing on, it doesn't do any good to stock a ton of dressing if no one knows how to use it. You need service line specific disaster declaration because the hospital may not have had a disaster, but if you only have X number of burn beds and you've already tripled the census, you have a problem. So not just a hospital, but a, a, a sp specific service line. Communication can be fragmented. Some of it can be cell towers. Some of it can be what people have to do. And some of it is when people are overwhelmed, they do the best they can. And I have to say, everyone who was in this fire did a great job. It's just you do what you can and you move forward. Triage, wildfires are more than a one and done. So if I, I was triaging for three days because the wind changed direction and suddenly there is a new evacuation area, which means there's new risk for further injuries. And it did happen. We did get patients after the initial. So how do I triage for what's going to happen in a day and a half when the wind changes direction? I can't. So you just kind of have to work with it. And hospitals can burn down. That has never been drilled in any drill. Actually, UC Davis is having a drill today. God bless them. Um, there's a disaster drills, and no one, no one drills for a hospital burning down in the middle of it. Because who would think a hospital would burn down? Well, it happened in the campfire. It happened in the Tubbs fire. In both fires, suddenly there was an influx of a ton of patients. Treatment, people don't stop getting burned because there is a wildfire. In the middle of all this, there was an explosion of somebody who decided that they needed a chemical substance. And three more people from an explosion came. So it happened right in the middle of all this. Um, there are some physical differences in treating wildfire patients, which we, I can talk about to anyone who may be interested. And the human nature is human nature. People stay with their houses. They'll stay and they'll get burned to save their house if that's all they have. They will stay for their animals as long as they can. And including animals in disaster planning is really important. We had patients, we could had a hard time separating them from their animals in the hospital. I can't imagine that a lot of these people would have separated for shelter. And my guess is that the people in the Walmart parking lot, a bunch of them had animals and that, 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 and that does pose issues. And thinking about it and proactively addressing it would be an issue. The media can be good. It can be bad. It was split. The good news is it went where the, the movie stars were. So it enabled us to have really good access to things. Um, the bad news is that when you, sometimes the media can help advertise and get you resources. And we did not have that. And systems, um, we need to integrate our specialty consortium with the, with the local, federal, and state in a more seamless way. Um, if we all have our own little plans, it's great for our own little worlds, but our worlds need to interact. And from that standpoint, the burn community, and that's why we, we want to work with everybody, to really make that happen. And it, it takes people on multiple levels. And things are expensive. And as I said, the hospitalization costs for this were real. The long-term costs for this are real. We have burn support groups built for this. We, as part of our mandate as a burn center, we have psychological screening on every single patient because they all fit the category. And we have to plan for disease. So burn planning needs some work. We need to integrate, but more disasters will happen. So it's really time to step up and do that. We'll develop more guidelines. We'll get more specific training and we'll have to eventually figure this out, but soon because the clock is ticking and we need to be prepared. As Spock and Kirk said, a priority change is necessary in burn disaster planning. Thank you very much.